There once lived in a quiet part of Devonshire a family who recently bereaved and penniless were forced to journey up to London and to beg for aid and succour from their only living relative. A wealthy man of business, Ralph Nickleby. And to avoid the burden of their upkeep, Ralph resolved that his nephew should become a teacher at a Yorkshire school. And that his niece should earn her daily bread by honest labour. And thus they both should learn the ways of thrift and business and look to no one to protect them but themselves. But uncle... Kate said. We are a simple family. We were born and bred in the country. We have never been apart. And we are unacquainted with the world. It will take time for us. It will take time. And arriving at the school of Mr. Wackford Squeers, Nicholas confronted the most terrible and brutal sights and happenings. And Kate found herself condemned to live a life of penury, drudgery and toil. And at last, Nicholas was forced to turn his fists against his master. And having rescued the school's weakest and most wretched inmate from the cruelty of Mr. Squeers... And with his new friend, fled back to his family. Ralph renounced him and commanded Kate and Mrs. Nickleby to cast off Nicholas as well. And it became clear to Nicholas that unless he left his family once again, then Ralph would leave them destitute. As a man of honour and business, he had no other course. And Kate begged Nicholas to stay with him, or else she and her mother would have no protection. But Nicholas replied that it was hard to be prescribed just like a criminal and to be forced to flee again, but he could not protect them. How could he protect them? And so Nicholas and Smike, the poor drudge that he had rescued from the school, set forth. And shortly afterwards, Kate found herself the victim of the vilest and most gross attentions of her uncle's dissolute associates. While Nicholas and Smike were most surprisingly engaged as actors in a travelling theatrical endeavour. And while they went on from one histrionic triumph to another, Kate alone denied even the protection of her uncle, despaired. And Ralph thought... As he sat alone in his cold and splendid rooms... That if Kate's mother died and Nicholas did not return... His house might be her home. But still... He thought... I know the world, I know it, and myself. All love is cant and vanity. Meanwhile, Nicholas returned to London. And freed his sister from the persecutions that she had been subjected to. And he told her that he would never leave her again. And she assured him that he had acted for the best. And Nicholas resolved that he, his mother and his sister, should renounce Ralph Nickleby and spurn his wealth and riches. And that they should not be beholden to him any more. And Ralph resolved in turn that if he, if they both affected to despise the power of money, he would show them what it is. And shortly after, Nicholas secured himself employment in the most delightful and agreeable of circumstances. And convinced himself that even here in London, it is possible for people to be decent, honest and good. And even that a young man from the country could, on the basis of one fleeting glance across a counting room... Fall immediately and hopelessly in love. I would. He thought. I would, I'd know her in 10,000. And thus it was that Nicholas, his mother and his sister Kate, now safe. His own position, happy and secure. Allowed himself to think. At last. That he had in all this wilderness of London found contentment. And the next day, in his little office... And on the top of his little stool... Newman Knox heard the chime of a neighbouring church clock... Looked up... And clicked his tongue... And soliloquised. My dinner's at two, and him not back until to wait three-quarters of an hour. It's done on purpose, of course. Just like him, I don't believe he has an appetite at all, except for pounds, shillings and pence. I'd like to see him made to swallow one of every English coin. The penny, two shillings, the crown. His humour being in some degree restored, Newman brought forth a little bottle. Shook it. Opened it. And restored it even more. While at the same time... At the offices of the Brothers Cheerable, Nicholas was asked by Mr. Charles... And Mr. Ned... If they could beg the quite immeasurable delight... Of his having a quiet word with them... In the privacy of their room. Yes, yes, of course, indeed. While Newman, having put away his bottle, heard the door and voices... That's it, he's back. He's got someone with him. It will be stay here till this gentleman's gone. I won't, that's flat. Knox! Knox! No, must have gone to his dinner. We'll use his room. It's cool and in the shade. <laughs> well, sit down, Mr. Grimes. Tell me what you want. 
Watch this. Oh, you're a bold and deep one, Nickleby. <laughs> No, sir. We would like to employ you on a confidential and delicate mission. The object of the mission is a young lady. Hey, a very beautiful young lady, whom I think you caught a glimpse of in these very offices the first time you came here. Ah, oh, yes, certainly. I do remember. So then? I'm going to be married. Oh, to some old hag with a fortune. No, to a young, dainty, bewitching little creature of not yet 19. Do you remember Walter Bray? Oh, I do indeed. He owes me money. As I recall, nine hundred and ten pounds, four shillings and something. Yeah, he owes me money too. A little more. And he's dying. And he has a daughter. The lady's father, sir, was married to a friend of ours. He was a wastrel and a profligate. His wife died, oh, about a year ago. He was committed to a debtor's house at the King's Bench Prison. We have, on numberless occasions, offered to assist her. But her father will not countenance that she receive our charity. And despite all our entreaties, she herself remains resolved to stay with him. So, she is destitute? She is. But I didn't think. Can such a thing be possible? Well, yes, Mr. Nickleby, I'm afraid it can. So, simply stated, your plan is this. You offer to release Bray from his debts. Perhaps you give him some small allowance so he can live in comfort for the rest of his life. And in return, you have his dainty daughter for your wife. That's correct. And as I am the other creditor, you come here to ask me how much I'll take. <laughs> That's right. I was thinking uh, nine shillings in the pound, perhaps. <laughs> right. Tell me the whole story. What? Oh, very well. So, good brother Charles and I considered and debated and resolved that we undertake a harmless subterfuge. That someone feigning to be dealing in small objects and drawings and the like should go to her and purchase what she makes for cash. Um, someone. There being no time like the present, can you go there now? Oh, yes, yes, of course, at once, without delay. But... Oh, very well. Supposing I was in possession of a deed concerning a little property to which this dainty lady was entitled and of which nobody knows but myself and which her husband would lay claim to. Would that perhaps explain why? The whole proceeding, yeah. yes, it would, yeah. Do you have the deed about you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I suppose I must. If I'm to have my bride, my dainty bride, I lash his lips, yeah, the fingers itch to play with. Well, I have no eye for beauty, I'm afraid, but if you choose to think you're buying her for love, I can't stop you. Buying her? Oh, come now, Mr. Grant. You have your dainty creature, Bray has his debts paid off, I have my profit, plus a share of this inheritance. We're all content. Now, shall we go? Oh, very well. <laughs> I think... I think I've lost my appetite. Oh, Mr. Charles! What? Back so soon? Oh, you haven't told me where she lives or oh, she is. Oh, please, give us her. Here is the address. The money and the order. The young lady's name is Madeline. Madeline. Father's name, Walter Bray. Nicholas, repressing every feeling that he should perhaps have stated his emotions with regard to the young lady, turned and left the chambers of the brothers Chirable and set a sprightly pace for King's Bench Prison. And the meagre debtors' houses that surrounded it. Madeline, what is this? Who told a stranger that we could be seen? Who is it? I believe that... It oh, yes, you always do believe. Well, what is it? Sir, I've called with a commission for a pair of hand screens and some painted velvet for an ottoman. I have a sum here as deposit of five pounds. Well, see, it's right then, Madeline. I'm sure it's absolutely right, Papa. You're sure? How can you be? I'm sure. Well, I was right to be, Papa. Now, go and get a newspaper. Some matters. Two bottles of that port I had last week, and I can't remember half of what I want. Well, you can always go out twice. And you can go too, sir, as soon as you've had your receipt. It is no matter, sir. No matter? What do you mean, sir? Do you think you bring your paltry money as a gift? 
It's business, sir. Return for value given. Damn you, sir. Do you know you're talking to a gentleman who in his time could have bought up 50 of such men as you and all you have? I merely meant, sir, that as I shall have many dealings with this lady. I should not trouble her with forms. We will have all the forms we need. My daughter, sir, requires no charity and will not be the object of your pity. Business, sir. Now, Madeline, receipt. When shall I? When shall I call again? When you are requested, sir, and not before. Oh, not for three or four weeks. It is not necessary. I can do without. Oh, not for three weeks, Madeline. Then sooner. Sooner, if you please. A week. Yes, then, a week. Here's your receipt, sir. Oh, thank you. In a week's time, then. Goodbye. Hey, where are you going, dear? Oh, he left. What? Oh, I'll, I'll be a moment, What father. has he left? Sir. I don't know if I'm doing right. But pray, don't mention to your masters what has happened here this morning. He has suffered much. Today he's very bad. I beg you, sir. You only have to hint a wish, and I would risk my life to gratify it. Oh, I speak the truth. I can't disguise my feelings. I can't hide my heart from you. I die to serve you. What more can I say? Say nothing. A week. How can I stand a week? And it must be in a week. Oh, come now, sir. Mr. Gride has money but no youth. Miss Madeline has youth and beauty but no money. It's a deal of heaven's making. Marriages are made in heaven, as they say. So, what do you reply? It's not for me to say, it's for my daughter. Yes, but you have power still to advise. <laughs> advise? I tell you, Nickleby, there was a time when my will carried against everyone. Her mother's family and friends with power and wealth on their side and just my will on mine. Well, there we are. Your wish is her command, I'm sure. But, if it isn't, What if I can't convince her? Well, then, shall we say I can see two pictures. One of Walter Bray, the fellow of fashion, as he once was, shining in society, in freer air, under brighter skies, in France, perhaps, certainly in luxury, a new lease of life. But then there's another picture, a churchyard, and a gravestone and a date. Perhaps two years, perhaps less, not more. Is it really not for you to say? Is it really for your daughter to decide? Nickleby, is it not cruel? Cruel, why? If he were younger, yes. But think, how long is it before your daughter is a widow? Yes, but still, and by this, she will be made rich and you will be young and bright and blazing once again. You will have cheated nature, Mr. Bray. Yes. Yes, you're right. It is for her as well as me. And she will live to thank you for it. <laughs> here she comes. Oh, Madeline, my dear. Here are two gentlemen. I see them, Father. You look so tired, my dear. I'm not indeed. Oh, yes, you are. You do too much. I wish I could do more. Well, I know, but still, you overtax yourself. This wretched life, my love, it's more than you can bear, I'm sure of it. It's more than I can bear. In a week, then, Mr. Bray. Yes, very well. A week. Yeah. Miss Madeline. If the lady... If the lady condescends... She's fine, may me go so soft. So soft! Oh, how do people dupe themselves? They have been here half an hour. Two men. One of them, Mr. Squeers. In your room now. Get me a coach. Whatever for. To ride in. To the Strand. Coach. The Strand. Coach! The Strand? I shall follow. He'd see me. Coach! The Nickleby's the Strand. There's mischief in it. There's sure to be...
Are you a coach? No. Oh, so, um. Are you the clerk of Mr. Nickleby? No. I mean, um, yes. Get him his coach. See him off in it. And then I want a word with you. Coach! And meanwhile, at the Strand, at Miss La Creevy's, the evening party was well underway. And it was universally agreed by all the guests... ...that they could not remember when they'd had such a time. And in particular, both John and Tilda Browdy wished it to be known by one and all... ...that they wouldn't have missed it for the world. Oh. Thank you so much, Mr. Browdy. As it happens, well, yes, I can't think... It's very that. good of you, Mr. Browdy, Mrs. Browdy, too. For, of course, you come to see us in a very plain and homely manner, as I said to Kate. I just can't think of when I had a... Husband. Kate, dearest, you will only make the Browdies feel uncomfortable if we indulge in great display. And think how inconsiderate that would be. <laughs> that is not to say... But I had a happier time myself. ...that we have no experience of high society. <laughs> Kate, do you remember all those parties at the Pelty Rogueses? <sighs> they used to live about a mile from us. Not straight, you understand, but turning sharp left by the turnpike at the point where the Plymouth Mail ran over someone's donkey. <laughs> Kate, you do remember the Pelty Road. Mama, I entertain of them the most vivid and distinct memories. Will they? But I also recall that earlier this evening, Mr Browdy promised he would sing us a song. Oh. And I'm sure we're almost impatient that he should redeem his promise. And I'm also certain that it will afford you much more pleasure and amusement than it's possible to think of. Well, now, what did you treat? Oh, sing a song. Yes, that's right. Oh, please do, Mr. Browdy. Uh, oh, yes. Well, um... Sometimes it's fancy. No, John. No. Uh, Ballad of John Barleycorn. I think that's better. Aye. Right. <laughs> Ah, oh, right. There came three men from out the west their victory to try. What's that? Must be some mistake. There's no one Well, the perhaps it's I'll answer it. Uncle, brother in law, what on earth? Now stay. And before that boy speaks, you'll hear me, ma'am. You won't, Mama. Don't hear him. I won't have it. I do not know that man. I... Come now, come now. I can't bear his presence. It's an offence to my sister. I will not! Oh, Nicholas, please. It's my home. Am I a child? Oh, this will drive me mad. Who is this man? It's Nicholas's uncle. Calls himself Ralph Nickleby. Ralph Nickleby. So, this is the boy. Come in, please. Gentlemen and Miss Ralph Nickleby. Hey, schoolmaster! Oh, Fanny! The enemies! Am I to stand here and allow this? To allow my home to be invaded by these people? It will not last long, sir. I come here on a very simple mission. To restore a child unto its parents. What? His son, sir, kidnapped and waylaid by you with the base design of robbing him someday of whatever wretched little pittance he might inherit. Uh, I bet you didn't think of this, eh? Got a father, hasn't he? And as a proof, here is the father, Mr. Snorley. There's your son. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Yes, here he is. My son. My flesh and blood. Not that much flesh. Come to me, boy. Just stay there. Well, I see further proof is required. Mr. Snorley, you had a son by your first marriage. Yes, I did, and there he stands. You and your wife separated, and after a year or two you heard that the boy had died. Yes, I did, and now that you... Now your... you have, in fact, discovered that the boy's death was an invention of your former wife's to wound you. He had, in fact, lived, though of unsound mind, and was sent to Mr. Squeer's school in Yorkshire. Is that not so? You speak like the good book, sir. That's got nothing in its inside but the truth. So I am expected to believe this fantasy. Certificates of birth, marriage, letters of the former wife, other documents, perhaps you'd care to read them, sir. Frank, Tim, you'll help me look over these. Cool. Well, sir. It seems you're reunited with your child. Oh, what a blessed moment. So I knew the moment you brought him to my house, I, I felt at once a, a burning and a tingling and a, a palpitation. That, that's the parental instinct. Sir. That's what it was, sir. There's no doubt about it. My heart yearned. Only shows what nature is, sir. <laughs> She's a rum one, isn't nature. She is a holy one, sir. <clears throat> I'm afraid there's little doubt about it. Everything's in order. It's a shame to say it, but it is so. Oh, Nicholas, it can't be true. Sir, if you are the father of this boy, 
Look, sir, at the wreck he has become. And tell us if you plan to send him back to that vile den my brother took him from. Vile den! Do you hear that, Mr. Nichols? Stay. There's a coach waiting. Everything is proved. Let's take young Master Snorley and be gone. The documents speak clearly. If our pleas won't move this man, then there's nothing we can do. They won't indeed. Have a father to abandon his own child? Come, son. The coach is waiting. Oh, you say cast noun substantive cast out home well. No, I won't, I won't go away again. Did you hear that? Smyker's chosen put himself. Oh, oh. Do parents bring children into the world for this? Do they bring him into the world for that? Now, come on, Blockhead, clear the way and let him take his boy. Yes, you've all blustered long enough. Yeah, what? Blockhead? Bluster? Well, I'll tell thee. I've released this poor chap from your clutches once already, and I'll not stand by and watch him going back in him again. Oh, Father, it was him. It was him. Let's my go. Ah, funny it were. And I tell you, take the hands off me. Oh. I've had enough of this. The lot of you, get out and leave the poor chap be. I'll tell you, sir. I'm telling you, out. Out, sir. sir. Tilda, ah. stop it. Two of them. You best get to your carriage too, sir, and you, Fanny. Tilda! Hey, Fanny! He's got me out! Tilda, I, I renounce you. I'll throw you off forever. I wouldn't have a child named Tilda not to save it from its grave. Come on now, Fanny. Oh, don't you meddle with my Christian name, don't you? Hey, Fanny, me out and I'll say Steely! Viper, vixen, false friend, artful, vulgar, murderdog! Oh, don't be silly, Fanny. Yes, Miss Squeers, your father's gone. Not going! Not without me out, I'm not! Oh, don't you speak to me! Oh, I'll have you, knuckle boy. Oh, I'll have you! Well, sir. If reason and good feelings fail you, it will have to be the law. But one thing I think is clear. I take it your romance about this boy has been destroyed. No unknown lost descendant of a man of high degree. But the weak, imbecilic son of some poor tradesman. Now, sir, leave this house. I know you. At least do not delude yourself. I know your nature. Good night, you ma'am. Well, what a business. No, no, he's right, of course. We <laughs> should be reasonable. If only it was possible to settle in a friendly manner. Say, say, if Mr. Snorley would agree to furnish something certain towards Smike's board and lodging, wouldn't it be much more satisfactory and pleasant for all parties? No, Mama, it wouldn't. You just don't understand. No. No, well, perhaps I don't. Perhaps I do, from time to time, find things a little hard to understand. 
Well now, Mr. Smike, it's getting late, and after all this excitement, shouldn't you be off to bed? I'm so grateful. Everything went black. I couldn't see. And John and Tilda... Having to depart tomorrow morning. ...took their leave. With many thanks. <laughs> and invitations to the company, if ever in North Yorkshire, to drop by. No, North, North Yorkshire. Yorkshire. <laughs> and though it was past midnight, Frank and Tim remained a moment longer. Dear Miss Lockreevy, please assure me that you're recovered from your terrible ordeal. Oh, you certainly do, Mr. Nickelbottom. Dear Miss Nickleby. I trust that all these violent altercations have not to disturb your constitution. Oh, no. I assure you, Mr. Cheerable. Thank you.